well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Miss June Bro. And uh, a few months ago, I was at the Whole Foods. You know, Whole Foods is where we all go now to meet our, see our friends now. And uh, I ran smack into June. Of course, of course, it wasn't an accident. We, don't, we all know about accidents, but we ran into June, and I, my first question was, June, how are you? My second question was, would you like to speak at the fellowship? <laughs> and June graciously said yes, enthusiastically, being, the, it being the most, one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever met, said enthusiastically yes. And so this is, this is how this talk came about. Um, June uh, is, uh, this was in uh, some literature that went out from the ARE this past week about a, a workshop. Uh, it was published that June is 95 years old. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, June worked with Edgar Casey and her husband, uh, uh, her husband, Harmon Bro. They came to Virginia Beach. She'll be telling us about that, but she really, literally is an eyewitness to history. June told me when we talked at Whole Foods that, uh, she, to the best of your knowledge, there's no one else around who really worked with Edgar Casey, and so it's really, really, we're really very blessed, you know, to have June come and tell us what what was this man's, who was this man, you know, who had such a huge impact on so many of us here and on so many, really thousands and thousands of people around the world and continuing today. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, I now would like to invite June up to, to share it with us. I'm set. <laughs> the way we thought we'd do this to make it real informal, like a family little talk here, is that I'm going to actually interview June, ask her some questions, and uh, then we're going to turn it over to you if you have any questions. <clears throat> and so to start, uh, June, uh, I'd like to just set, uh, set the stage, if you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself personally, like where you were born and where you were raised and how you met Harmon and so forth. I was born in a little town called Ironwood in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and uh, my mother was a piano teacher, so she started me on the piano at age four. So I've been, how long have I been playing, 94 years? 91 years. 91 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of piano playing, right? <laughs> um, let's see. I had uh, four siblings, and uh, we were a very happy family. Didn't have much money, but we, we got, my mother made sure that we heard the best music that came to town, and that we were all, let's see, my brother Bob, my older brother, played three instruments, and my, uh, my twin brothers, dumb, lower than, younger than me, played the flute and the clarinet, and my sister played the cello. And so, you know, there was always music going on in our house. You believe that. Um, what else did you want to how know? Did you meet, how did you meet Harmon? Well, he was at Williams College in Massachusetts, all male at that time. Now it's coordinated with women. But um, he, got, he got to a place where he couldn't do his his uh, essays and couldn't write his exams anymore. He just wanted to drop out of school. He wanted to be a union <laughs> organizer, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and his parents, who are all, I mean, they're college presidents and, and ministers and professors and you know, that whole Harmon clan, and so they would not hear of him just dropping out of school. So anyway, they said, why don't you go to that little tiny college up in Northland, Wisconsin, up in Ashland, Wisconsin, called Northland. And uh, so he had to be talked into it, but finally he decided to come up there. But at that time, it was just a little state school. It wasn't much of a college at all. And uh, teachers mainly went to that school. So um, anyway, they had a wonderful choir director that had been at St. Olaf's and trained at St. Olaf's and 16 uh, came to our city, the little town of Ironwood, which was about 40 miles from Ashland, where he was in Northland College teaching choir. And uh, we did a Messiah every year. So he said, uh, um, 
You know, the pianist that was supposed to arrive, Doris Rispes, hasn't arrived. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And somebody said, well, June Bro, no, June Larson at that time. June Larson, she, she can read anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Messiah? I've heard me reading for the first time. But anyway, I did my best. And afterwards, he said, June, I'm coming over to talk to your folks. You're coming to Northern College. So I did. That was just a fluke that I went to Northern College also. And so Harmon and I met in the choir, and he needed a lot of help with his voice. <laughs> and so he would come to my little studio, and we'd work on, on the songs. Uh, but anyway, we got to be really good friends. And very serious after a while, I was, let's see, how old was I then? Uh, I was uh, 20, 21 maybe. OK. So that's how that happened. Wow. That's how I met Harvard. <laughs> right. We used to take long walks down Highway 13 in the winter. Believe me, it was cold up there <laughs> in the winter and lots of snow. But we would have so much fun. We'd just tussle in the snow and, wow. and uh, sing, you know, the college songs wow. as we walked. <laughs> and uh, how old were you when you ended up getting married and how many children did you have? I was uh, 43, just in turn. 43, what am I saying? <laughs> it was 1940. It was in 1940. There you go. I was 23. And, uh, yeah, sounds better. <laughs> I'm 95, please be patient with me, okay? Yeah. Well, I'm not 95, I'll be 95 June 16th. Oh, okay. That's close enough. Yeah, yeah, June 16th. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, and so I was asking, uh, about, you said you were 23 when you married, yeah. when you married uh, Harmon. And how many, I know you, uh, we know Pam, how many other children did you have? I had four besides Pam. Pam was our first. And then there's Erica. I wanted a house full of boys, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> I adored my older brother and my twin brothers, and I just wanted a house full of boys. And one girl after the other. So Pam was born, Erica was born, Greta was born, Allison was born, finally I got a son. <laughs> <laughs> so I have five children. Wow. And uh, June, uh, can you share with us like the chain of events that uh, you went through, the experience you went through that finally brought you and Harmon to Virginia Beach to work with Edgar Casey? Well, I had gotten a full scholarship to uh, the Chicago Musical College. My mother-in-law's dearest friend was Myrtle Walgreen of the Walgreen drugstores. She was the lady, she was a wonderful woman. She was the lady who started the, the um, coffee at the, um, what do you call it, counter in the drugstore. Oh. She was the first one to do that. And, and so people would go there and drink her soup and her coffee. and. She was one of, anyway, she invited us out to dinner one night. And, um, and at the end of it, she said, uh, June, I had just come from Drake University to Chicago. Drake is in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, she said, what are you planning to do now? And I said, well, I've been looking over the music schools. And I said, um, there's one that I like, uh, the Chicago Musical College. And she said, well, Every time someone in the family has a birthday, we give a gift. And so we're going to pay your entire tuition at the Chicago Musical College. So, you know, I thought I was destined to be a great pianist. I was going to be concertizing or teaching at Juilliard or something like that. Well, then my mother-in-law goes and is asked to review There is a River about Mr. Casey for the Christian Century. You probably know that magazine. It's the, the most popular um, Protestant magazine. And uh, so she, she wrote a review for uh, the Christian Century. And she got so in interested in, in the man and his work that she decided to go down there. And she decided that she would just get to know these people. And uh, 
they shared, the, the disciples of Christ denomination, my mother-in-law's people had been ministers and, and, and professors and presidents of, of disciples colleges and universities for decades and decades. And uh, so she thought, he comes from the same denomination I do, we'll have a lot in common. And uh, she had been a missionary to China. And in fact, my husband was born there, came back to this country when he was six. And um, so she had a lot that she wanted to share with Mr. Casey. So she got a speaking engagement out east in New York probably, and came down here and stayed with the Caseys for a week. And of course she got, got readings for all of her children, but Harmon and I were not yet married. So anyway, she, um, the minute she walked in, Edgar said to her, you've got to come and talk to our missionary society. <laughs> and she said, oh no, I want to get readings and talk with you. You've got to talk to the missionary society. Edgar loved the church. He had grown up in it. He had done everything you can do in a church, from janitor to teaching the youngsters to teaching adults. He, he just, uh, the church was his home. That's where he lived. And of course, in those days, the church was the center of a lot of activity in a small town like Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And so um, it, he, the church meant a lot to him. And uh, so she went and talked to the Missouri Society, but then they talked. And uh, um, it, was, it was really very deep and, and wonderful. And uh, her, her own readings were, were very enlightening about who she was and where she had been in past lives. This is always helpful, but it's also, <laughs> also hard for family members um, to know these things. But I think it's mostly helpful. Uh, so where do I go from there? Well, what brought, how did you end up in Virginia Beach? Oh, oh, well, Hugh Lynn, Mr. Casey's son, um, was in the war effort in the Army, and uh, he had been the manager of the ARE, and they needed somebody to help out. Well, uh, Harmon's reading had said, this entity has worked with the sources of this information and should again. What did that mean? He didn't have an incarnation given where he was with Jesus. And I know that's what Edgar thought was the, the spirit and the, and the source of his readings, the helpfulness. Um, but anyway, Harmon, um, they decided to ask Harmon to come in and help out in the office. And by the time we got there, Harmon's mother, Marguerite, had written an article for the um, Cornet magazine, very, not any longer in existence, but very small, like the uh, Reader's Digest, but it was very popular then. She called the article, Miracle Man of Virginia Beach. Well, let me tell you, they had to hire a whole new floor of secretaries <laughs> to handle the mail that came in. And of course, then the mail went and came in at the Casey residence. They had never had a flood of requests for readings like this. And of course, they didn't quite know what to do with it all. Gladys had uh, set the readings ahead two years, and the letters were still coming in. And you know, Edgar had to walk past these mailbags, because we couldn't get to all the letters right away. I helped out in the office, actually, half a day. My husband, in his wisdom or his kindness or whatever, rented a grand piano so I could practice in the morning. <laughs> and in the afternoons, I went to the area and worked with them. So anyway, um, what was I going to tell you? Oh, so Edgar walked past those mailbags. You don't, you, you don't think for a minute that he had to read the letters to know what was in there. He felt the pain in those letters. He was the last hope for so many people. Mr. Casey, the doctors have told me that my, my uh, wife is dying of cancer and, and they can't do anything. Can you help me? Mr. Casey, my son is, 
He's lost in action. Can you help me find him? This is the Second World War. And, um, oh, many things like that. And, and he knew it was in those letters, he knew. And anyway, so, you know what he did? He started, his readings had said, Edgar, one or two readings in the morning, one or two in the afternoon, okay? And um, all of a sudden, he started giving five, six, seven, eight. Now, if any of you are counselors, you know what a drain that can be. And so we watched him. First, he lost his voice, as it happened many times in his life. And then his body just slowly weakened and, and couldn't give readings. This was very hard to see him this way. But you know, we didn't have a worry in the world. He had the readings, he had people that loved him, uh, he had Jesus on his side. How could he die or lose anything? So, um, after he, he really was going down, he decided to go to see Dr. Riley in New York. Now, Dr. Riley was an osteopath and a very fine, mus uh, fine musician, fine physician. And um, uh, he, he followed Edgar's readings to the, to the small point. And so Edgar trusted him. He knew that Dr. Riley would do exactly what his readings had said. So he went, decided to go to New York. And he gave Harmon and me the greatest present of our lifetime, I think. He said, how would you two like to go with me? We were 23 years old. And of course we said that would be wonderful. So we went with him all for a day on the train going and a day on the train coming back and staying at the hotel with him about two weeks. And Edgar was someone who loved to tell stories and he could tell them marvelously. He just had you sitting on the edge of your chair. And so, you know, we should have said, Edgar, save your voice. We want you to be able to give readings for many years. But we just sat there and listened because you couldn't turn him off, number one. <laughs> you know, was, there was no way. And um, he, he had quite a quite, um, sense of what he needed to do and what he felt was right, and you couldn't talk him out of these things. So anyway, we had this marvelous, marvelous time with him. And, uh, when we came back, Gladys and Gertrude decided that he was well enough to give readings again. Well, this made us all happy. So he called all the staff in in the afternoon, and he was going to do a reading on his health. And so we were all there praying for him and hoping the reading would go well and everything. And his voice was still soft, so we had just kind of lean to hear every word, and, um, and, and his voice was gentle. It was like, like the voice of Jesus sometimes, uh, and you can imagine what it was like. And, and Edgar, you know, his, when in a reading once in a while, he'd say, he would just stop everything and say, oh, the master passes by with the utmost respect and love and um, this is the way he felt about Jesus. Jesus was his center and, and the reason for his work. This is what he felt, and I was sure of it after experiencing him and his Sunday school at, at the Presbyterian Church on Sunday mornings. Harvard and I never missed that. And uh, he, was, um, he loved that. That, that Sunday school class, it was adults. And, um, and he, I remember one time he said to us that the seats over to the right were not occupied. So he said, did you, did you see who came and sat in there? And Harvard and I shook our heads, we didn't see anybody. He said there were a group of rabbis. 
and he just wanted to know what I was talking about, so he came in and sat down over there. Well, you know, this is the kind of thing that happened. <laughs> like the first time I, I went there, Harmon went a week early to meet the Casey's and to, to talk with them, make sure everything was okay. And so I came later, and when they invited me to their home for the first time, um, I remember sitting there, Mr. Casey looking at me and saying, June, do you see that lamp cord on the ground? It's not plugged in, is it? I looked, no, what plugged in? He said, do you see that lamp over there? Burning brightly. That's the kind of thing that happens around here. <laughs> and Gertrude looked at him and she said, Edgar, with her southern accent, that's the cord to another lamp. <laughs> and, but you, this is the kind of person he was. He, he could be funny, he could uh, laugh at himself, he, could, he didn't take things too seriously, you know? And, and in, in the vocation he was in, you better not take him too seriously. Uh, so um, he was a delight to be with, just a delight. And you know, from, from the first book that was written about him, Tom Shapiro's book, There is a River, paints him as kind of a little <coughs> Catholic saint because <laughs> Tom was Catholic. And, and you know, <laughs> what we discovered was that he was not a saint, and he's the last one who would say that anyway. <laughs> He was very human, and um, he um, would, would do outlandish things. I mean outlandish things. And if you think he was just a simple, simple religious man, no, this was someone who could dream things up. He used to go out fishing. He loved fishing. So he'd go out in uh, Lake Holly, right, right on the lake where he lived, and take his boat and go up there. And you know how hot that sun can be, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know what he did? He sawed off a half a keg, I guess you call it a keg. In the bottom part, he planted dirt and planted a tree. And so he could pull that little thing behind him <laughs> and get shade whenever he needed it. <laughs> well. So you know, he was no simple, sweet, Saint, all he knew was prayer and stuff. No, no. He was very much into living his life as fully as he could. He lectured in many places. The first Congress I went to, you know, they have a Congress every year, and everybody from the area that loves it comes and, and meets and talks and has all kinds of uh, uh, lectures and all kinds of things. Anyway, uh, the first one I went to, Edgar was there. This was in June of 1944. And Edgar lectured. Now this is no simple man, right? Who can stand up there and make sense to you about a lot of things that we don't understand. And he, um, he lectured three times that weekend. He also gave three readings, three readings, one for his health, one for the board. How would you like to be on the board to have a reading given for you? Well, you know, if there was this opportunity and you missed it, kind of thing. But um, he, he was just an engaging man. And then after the lectures, and we'd have a break, he came and sat with everybody in a big room. They were just gathering, and, and they would sit down to talk with each other. He would come join us because he loved people. He was an extrovert. Gertrude was the introvert. And it was very hard for her to deal with all the people that came into there. See, the, the office was built onto the home. So Edgar just had to walk from his dining room into the office. And so sometimes people would just wander into her home. And this would be very upsetting to her. So she had a dream. And she was on the seashore, picking up seashells, putting them in a basket. And just, just a lot of seashells. And when she took a reading on that dream, it said, these are the people that come into your life these days. 
Some are beautiful and whole, some are cracked, some are, um, uh, let's see, washed out, kind of, you know, not, not clearly colored anymore. Some have um, strange shapes now with the water having pushed them against the sand. And um, I said, you need to look at everybody that comes in here and give thanks for them and see that they, they are all God's children and they all need God's love and they all need help from your husband. And um, so she, she changed with that dream. What a powerful dream. Wow. That's what dreams can do. Mm -hmm. So, well, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're going right along here. Uh, let's see, why don't we open this up? We've got time maybe for two or three questions. Anybody out there have any questions they'd like to ask? How about you, Pilar? Sure he did. He loved talking about them. Okay. Um, them. One day he came to me. He said, June, come with me over to the window. There was a window, big picture window looking out over Lake Holly. And there were trees, big trees in the backyard. And he said, uh, you see that tree there? Yeah, I saw the tree. You see those little people down there? I didn't see anything. But that's the way he was, you know, and he would just explain, well, they're playing together. They're just having a wonderful time. And, and you know, and he had imaginary friends when he was young, too. Um, so, yeah, he saw things, and, and they were real to him. Oh, uh, um, did Edgar Casey ever go into any kind of explanation on extraterrestrials and what role they have to play in it wasn't anything you talked about in those days. I'm not even sure it was a movie yet in 1940. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but uh, yeah, he said what Jesus did. That there are many, many realms. And uh, it's not just the earth and heaven. No, much more complicated universe than that. So you have to quit. No, 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 no. This is oh. beautiful. Yeah, go ahead. My mother's maiden name was Edmonds. I don't know if there was a relationship or not, but I know there were two Edmonds ladies involved with the Casey work. Related or not, I was just curious. Did you know these two ladies? Of uh, uh, Edmonds or Edwards? Edmonds. E D M O N D. -S. Oh, I knew Florence Edmonds. Okay, I just was wondering about that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I knew all the women from the first, and men from the first study group. They were in the first study group that he, they, they heard that William Scott Kelly was uh, teaching people how to be psychic. So they came to Edgar and said, would you teach us how to become psychic? He mm -hmm. said, well, we'll try. So what do you think came out of him? This is what you do in the dark, and you light some candles, and, <laughs> and you, you know, Take off, no. Get to know yourself, meditate, learn to cooperate. You know, it was the fruits of the spirit that Jesus talked about. Patience, that kind of thing. But they hung together for 10 years. And um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience for them. Here we go, listen. Hi, Jim. I, I was wondering how uh, of course, if this is too personal, don't answer it, but could you explain how knowing Edgar and being so involved, having so many readings, uh, knowing him personally, uh, the effect that you feel, now that you can look back and have hindsight, that it had on your development as a woman and mother and wife, oh my God. how you evolved <laughs> as a human being? Had you not had that? <laughs> well, I tell you what, he put me in peace because I thought I was going to be this great pianist. <laughs> and he said, do make the home the career because this is the greatest career there is in the earth. 
and I think I had dodged it or left family at times in the past. And this was the time to make up for that. Hmm. And um, yeah, and, and he said, use your music to keep harmony in the home. That's what he said. <laughs> wow. That's powerful. Yeah. 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 Um, recently, uh, Neil Helm uh, announced that he found that Edgar Casey once had a near-death experience. I wonder if he ever mentioned that to you. He didn't, no, and not, not in my memory, um, but I've heard about that also. I'm sure it's true. I'm sure it's true. There's a lot of hands out here, so I'm trying to get as many as I can, but I, I saw you, you had your hand raised a minute ago. Have you read Sidney Kirkpatrick's book? Oh, yeah. You know, it focuses a lot on how difficult it was for Edgar to accept what was coming through him and how in his early life he judged himself a lot and had to make a transition oh, to did. accept that. I just I wondered if you would comment on you know how he felt about what was coming through. This is how he felt about his gift, okay? One way that he felt about it. He had a dream and in it there was a child before him, a very beautiful child, but he didn't know whether it was uh, I forget the modern term for it, um, challenged, mentally challenged or very, very bright and capable. So um, he had to be reassured about his gift over and over again. He didn't get the feedback that you need when you have a gift like that. Oh, Edgar, you're really, really helped me. You know, uh, he had a, a board, a uh, cork board, and on it he had uh, pictures of all of the dear people that had sent him um, something about their readings and a picture of them. A lot of women in bathing suits and things like that. <laughs> but he, he had his little fan club up on that. That's work. <laughs> yes, how about you? Um, you were dealing with this during World War II. How was he reacting or responding to World War II? Was he just Okay, because he knew that. Um, response that to what? About World War II. Did, oh was he my okay God. that everything was going to turn out all right? I mean, or, or was he. No, he of, didn't have that feeling at all. He knew that he would never see his sons. Both his sons were in the Army. Wow. And uh, he just knew that. And he also had a vision before the war ever began. And he saw very biblical chariots riding across the sky and everything turned blood red. Wow. And so he was really, really shaken up when he saw that. And he couldn't shake it or take part in anything for several days. And it hit him so hard. So he, he knew what was coming. For those of you who don't know, he died uh, January 3rd, 1945, when the war was still raging in Europe. The Battle of the Bulge at that time was just coming to an end. And it was a few more months before the war actually ended. But he, so both of his sons were in Europe. And he he never saw them again. Never saw them. And uh, so he that's what he he was right about that. Yeah. 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 Well, you finished telling about the reading um, when you did the health reading, and all of you were in the room. You started about how his voice was quiet. Oh, I didn't finish that, did I? <laughs> Have I got time? We got plenty of time for you. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Yes, he was in the middle of this reading, finally feeling that, that he was getting better, could give readings again, and there, there was a kindness in his voice. Oh yes, I got off on Jesus, didn't I? He, there was a kindness in his voice who said, um, take care of your, your body, it is the temple. Um, you know, do what we have outlined for you. And uh, be kind to those, even who are impatient or unkind. And it was just that kind of soft voice and, and re re encouraging. And uh, all of a sudden, out of the blue, because we were hearing him being gentle to himself, be gentle with, with others, and all of a sudden, the loudest voice I've ever heard in my life, and my husband has a very loud voice, or had one, <laughs> very loud. I don't know how it is, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and it said, 
Bow thine heads, ye children of men. Boy, we all bowed our heads, right? <laughs> and he said, For I, Michael, Lord of the way, would have words with thee. And he's very stern. And for ye who are unregenerate, I didn't even know what that meant. Unresponsive, ungrateful, you know, and he was talking about us. How, who else could he have been talking about? And he said, For there. Today there is set before thee good and evil. And there could come that sudden reckoning. We had no idea what the sudden reckoning was. I'm sure Michael was saying, he could die, folks. He could die, and the whole reading thing could be gone, over. And um, so I, I really, Harmon and I, after, oh, then he, then he um, uh, said, um, do what you have been called to do, and don't be pigs. That's how he ended it. Don't be pigs. Well, I tell you what, we all skulked out of that room. Nobody said a word. Harmon and I walked up and down the beach for hours and trying to figure it out. And, you know, I, I kept thinking, yeah, we, we didn't know what to do. We didn't have the modern conveniences, just the old mimeograph machine and old typewriters. And, yeah. and no recording even for him wow. when he's giving his readings. Nothing like that was available then. And so uh, I'm sure there was a lot of um, hectic kind of activities in the office. And, uh, and it should have been as peaceful as possible for Edgar, of course, in, in those days. And if you let him in there, he would have said, Dad, get out there on the lake and fish. And he'd say, Dad, get out in your garden. He had a green thumb. Get out in the garden and work. Hugh Lynn would have been a voice of help for Edgar, but um, he wasn't there. And so Edgar just gave more and more readings until he was worn out. And. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the way it was. Finally, Kevin Tedeschi, who is the president of the ARE, asked me if I would speak to the board, no, to the staff. That was it. And um, I, I prayed about what to say, what to share. And, and it came to me I should share this experience of Michael with them. And, when I finished, um, well, before, before I went in there, uh, this came to me. It's not that you people were so bad and so unthinking and, and unable to handle things. It wasn't that. It's that the work is so important. And so that's what I said to them. This work, and it's Paul's work too, this work must go on. And, um, and keep trying as hard as we can, do what we can to live as, as Jesus would have us live. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. How about